Hi, my name is Johanna Weaver and I'm the Director of the Tech Policy Design Centre at the Australian National University. I'm also the host of the Talking Tech Policy podcast, which we're going to be launching with this conversation. As we're meeting here today at Parliament House, it seems particularly poignant uh, to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Ngunnawal people. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and I extend that respect to uh, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are tuning in today. Minister, thank you very much uh, for giving us your time. Um, we're here with Minister Fletcher, the Minister for Communication, uh, Urban Infrastructure, Cities and the Arts. Thank you very much for being here. Very pleased to be with you. When we agreed to, uh, to do this interview, it was a few weeks back and um, we agreed to interview to talk about your book, yes. Governing in the Internet Age. And of course, um, there's a lot happening in your portfolio at the moment, so it's particularly um, a, a great time to have the conversation. And we will get into some of the recent announcements, um, including around the, the troll legislation and the uh, inquiry um, into big tech that the government announced yesterday. But before we do that, I wanted us to take a step back um, and contextualise the period of change that we've had, because I think everybody that works in this house knows and understands how difficult governing is, full stop. Mm. But in the context of governing around technologies, um, the technologies are not new anymore, I think it's fair to say, but comparative to many of the other issues, we don't have the same amount of, of precedent and experience. So when I was asked to write uh, something for the Monash University Press series um, in the national interest, I thought about what I wanted to write about and decided that the growth of the internet and what it meant for government would be an interesting topic, particularly because it's now frighteningly uh, 25 years since I first got involved in this space when I started working for then Communications Minister Richard Alston. I'd uh, recently come back from the US where I'd done an MBA and over that time the internet had, at that point it was just emerging. Um, so uh, you know when I left Australia there was certainly no retail internet service providers, there was also no subscription television, almost nobody had a mobile phone. But it was the start of a period of great change and that really um, accelerated very, very quickly. And so the internet, of course, now, as I chart in the book, is uh, a commonplace part of life and billions of people around the world are, are connected. Um, but that's really only happened over about 25 years. Certainly if you take the period within which the internet has gone from being a tool used by a relatively small number of re researchers and academics to becoming a mass market phenomenon. So I thought it was interesting to kind of, I guess, try and look at that period and just make some observations about what that has meant for government. Yeah. And can I ask, because I, I do love to ask this question because it puts it in context for the individual. Um, what was your first interaction with a computer or the first time you heard and used the internet? Because I think when we reflect on those personal stories, it helps to realise how far we've come in such a short period of time. Well, I point to a couple of things. Firstly, my dad was an academic. He finished his career as professor of computational engineering at UNSW. So... Um, we always had around the house stacks of computer paper and programming cards and so on going back to the sort of late 60s, early 70s. I remember a couple of science projects, which nominally I did, but he largely did <laughs> uh, on a computer. Um, then probably when I got to business school, I took a class called Management of Media Information and Communications, which really opened my eyes to the whole sector. And the professor who taught the class was talking a lot about this thing called the internet, which I'd never really heard of before. And we had to go and do some basic exercises, you know, file transfer protocol and uh, gopher. Um, so that was kind of 93, 94. So that probably started to open my eyes a bit to it. But certainly there was no, at that stage, there were no browsers. So you still needed to use some rudimentary computing language to be able to access the internet. And of course that all changed very, very quickly. And that's one of the factors that was obviously key in the internet then becoming uh, a mass market consumer phenomenon. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And if you think 1993 was when the World Wide Web, as we know it, was unleashed upon the world. And so it really isn't that long ago. And without wanting to date myself too much, I think I am part of one of the only genera- one of the last generations, at least in Australia, that can experience life before, remember life before yep. the internet and life after the internet. So um, at the Tech Policy Design Centre, the the key focus of our mission is um, how do we get more people engaged in conversations around technology policy? And I think as the Minister for Communications, it's it's not actually always a given that the Minister um, has deep expertise in their portfolio, and that certainly is the case for you, having been a Ministerial Advisor, um, Parliamentary Secretary, also having uh, worked in at Optus um, for Corporate Regulatory Affairs. So with the expertise that you bring to this field, um, can you explain to someone without um, a particular deep expertise in tech policy and someone who doesn't work in the tech industry, why are these issues important to the average Australian? Why should they be focused and and concerned or um, advocating um, on these issues? I think tech policy issues are enormously important because of the way they underpin the lives that all, almost all of us lead. The, um, the ACCC reported that Facebook has over 17 million Australians who use it every month and in its digital platforms review and over 90 million Australians use Google every month. So first of all, um, these are very widely used services. Secondly, and I spent a bit of time talking about this in the book, from the point of view of all of us as consumers, the internet has given us many, many options we didn't have before. And I argue that's even more so for a relatively small economy like Australia compared to big economies like the US or big countries in Europe or Asia. And so the choices that it gives you as a consumer on things like um, being able to instantly get information about different interest rates when you're looking for a mortgage, that was just in practical terms impossible 30 years ago. So um, I think these tech policy issues are important because of the benefits the internet can deliver, but then what are the business models under which it's delivered? And so the Digital Platforms Inquiry, which uh, led to, amongst other things, the News Media Bargaining Code, which we legislated earlier this year, was looking at the market power of Google and Facebook. One of the things that's happened with the internet is that it's been the basis for very large businesses, global businesses, and there's been a tendency for one business to dominate in a particular category. And it's argued that that's a consequence of, I guess, the economic characteristics of internet businesses, increasing returns to scale. So the bigger you get, the lower your costs are, and therefore the harder it is for anybody to compete with you. And that is why search is dominated by Google, um, it's why you know, Amazon has had such a dominant position in, um, in e-commerce and so on. That raises a lot of public policy questions. We've always, um, or for, for a long time, governments have been interested in the question of market power, um, you know, what, the US, what in the US is called antitrust and what here is called competition law, and ultimately what does that mean about the prices at which we can purchase services. So I think those... Um, those are some reasons to be why all Australians should be concerned about technology policy, but also then things like uh, privacy, um, security, uh, safety. The, the internet has become, and particularly social media platforms, have become the digital town square where so many of us interact. Now we take for granted that if we interact in the physical town square that if something goes wrong, uh, we can go to the police, uh, we can, um, you know, if we're assaulted or if we're defrauded, we can um, go to the courts. Uh, and people naturally assume the same protections are available to them when they interact in the digital town square. But it's more complicated. Uh, and one of the reasons it's more complicated is that the platforms are giant global businesses operating in 150 plus countries. So one of the questions is which country's laws apply and how do governments uh, require these global businesses to comply with the laws of your country when operating in your country.
So um, let's talk about some of the measures that the government has implemented um, to look at how we can engage in the online town square, if you like. And I think the most topical one at the moment is the legislation um, or the draft bill that was introduced or released yesterday around tackling anonymous uh, online trolling. Um, And that legislation, um, in your book, you talk about um, governments gaining more confidence Mm. to legislate. And I think that is unequivocally the case, that we are seeing more confidence. Mm -hmm. What I'm interested in and and the focus of the work that we're doing at the Tech Policy Design Centre is to look at our governments being effective in their regulation now. Because I think step one, let's Mm. admit that we should be regulating. Step two, let's regulate um, in in a way that achieves its objective. So you use the example of um, cars and seatbelts and the evolution of regulatory um, technology. Cars didn't have seatbelts to begin with, then um, regulators stepped in. In the case of seatbelts, there's a clear um, evidence that um, seatbelts saves lives. Mm -hmm. With the anonymous online trolling, has the government got, uh, or do you have evidence that the anonymity online and unmasking of anonymous trolls will actually lead to less of that behaviour, that anonymity will actually um, uh, help us to reduce it? Look, I think there's ample evidence that online harassment, bullying, abuse has very detrimental consequences, including mental health consequences. Sadly, there have been uh, instances of suicides and so on. One of the principles we've sought to apply is regulating just enough. Um, So with our news media bargaining code, which we legislated earlier this year, that was dealing with the problem of content, news media content, generated and paid for by Australian news media businesses like Seven West Media or Nine Entertainment Limited. That costs money, costs money to employ journalists and editors and so on. And yet the public policy problem was that that content was being used by the digital platforms as part of their very successful process of attracting eyeballs to their sites, monetizing those and so on. But they weren't paying for it and there wasn't the normal commercial transaction that would occur. What we did was set up strong incentives for the platforms to commercially negotiate. Uh, And that has worked. And indeed there have been, um, I think, some 14 or 15 uh, deals done by Google. So creating the incentive for the commercial deals. Now, if we go to the legislation that we released in Exposure Draft of of yesterday, the anti-trolling legislation, the primary um, framework that that's dealing with is the question of defamation. So the law is well established that uh, if I write in a newspaper or say on television or or radio, you know, um, that that Paul Fletcher is is a lying scoundrel, Um, uh, and make other comments that are damaging Mm. to the reputation of of, of a person, then the person who has been the subject of those comments has a right to sue in defamation. And then the law is well established as to whether um, a case is made out and so on. Mm. Um, That same right should be available wherever the defamatory comments are made, whether they're made online uh, as well, but there are major practical barriers to commencing legal action at the moment. Um, at the same time, we've seen a significant increase in the volume of people complaining about these issues because the internet has given many more people voice, a proportion of the comments that are made will be problematic, including a proportion will be defamatory. So the aim is fundamentally to create strong incentives for the platforms to set up a complaint scheme under which if I consider that I've been defamed by somebody who said something online, I can go to the platform and say, connect me with that person, give them the opportunity to take it down, or alternatively give them the opportunity to to ask them to release their contact details so that I can commence legal action against them should I choose to do that. And then there'll also be a power for the federal courts to issue an order uh, requiring the disclosure of information. So what we're trying to do again is regulate just enough. We want to create strong incentives for the platforms so in turn uh, they can put in place an efficient complaint scheme.
So I, so I understand that um, you want to regulate just enough uh, and also that the behaviour, um, there is I think very few people in Australia who would want to see this type of behaviour continue. No one is saying um, the behaviour of trolls is acceptable. Um, but um, I guess the question is, will the a removing anonymity actually achieve the objective? And I, I use here the example of in Korea. So yes. back in 2012, the Koreans uh, introduced similar legislation um, and actually the Korean courts ended up um, overruling that legislation on the basis that um, it actually, there was no demonstrable um, impact of that, uh, of the uh, removing anonymity on reducing that type of malicious online behaviour. So I guess it's more a question of does, is the target of anonymity actually going to achieve the objective that you're setting here? Uh, I would define the target as being um, making, uh, not allowing uh, people to make comments online uh, with impunity, beyond, beyond the reach of normal uh, legal and regulatory safeguards that have long existed. Mm. And I also make the point that this is part of a suite of laws, and earlier this year we passed the Online Safety Act, that will come into effect in January yeah. next year. That deals with uh, serious cyber abuse of adults and it complements the scheme we already have in place for cyberbullying of children. It's a pretty high threshold there, so that if a, if a uh, if something if an online statement uh, would be considered by a reasonable person to be menacing, harassing, or offensive, and intended to cause harm, mm. so quite a high threshold. But if it meets that threshold, the eSafety Commissioner can determine that it is um, cyberbullying material, cyber abuse material directed at an Australian adult and direct that it be taken down. Mm. So the point is, that's one part of a framework to deal with um, unacceptable uh, uh, material online. And then another part of the framework we're now adding in is to deal with the issue of defamation. So um, uh, not necessarily proposing, uh, constituting a direct threat to somebody but um, attacking somebody's reputation and at least giving people in practical terms the opportunity to, um, uh, should they choose to, seek redress. So anonymity is um, one of the practical hurdles today mm. which means that the normal recourse to the law of defamation that is available in practical terms today it's quite hard to access when it comes to comments made online. So I'd, I would really like to drill down a little bit more on the, the way that this new law will interact with the e-safety um, provisions. But before we do that, um, one of the other aspects of this new legislation that's been introduced, it was in part a response to the High Court case um, involving VOLA, which had a, 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 um, a, the result being that people who um, have social media pages become responsible for defamation defam defamatory comments uh, made on those pages, whether or not you made them and whether or not you knew they were there. And this legislation is saying, well, now um, the platform uh, will be responsible for that defamatory comment rather than me as the owner of the Facebook page, for example. Um, one of the concerns that I've seen about that provision, whilst it's great that there's certainty that individual um, users of, um, of platforms are not going to be held liable for comments that they're not making themselves, that it might disincentivise people to do content moderation, that it may actually end up that whilst the objective is to reduce this type of unacceptable behaviour um, and trolling, that actually it will result in less content moderation because we've moved the burden. What do you say in response to that? Well, you're right to say that part of what this bill does is respond to the law as it was set out in the High Court case in Vola, which said if you have a Facebook page, whether you're a, um, an ordinary citizen or a business, and a third party makes a comment on that which is defamatory, you are liable. Um, uh, and our policy judgment is that's not the right uh, allocation of liability. So what this bill will do, should it pass into law, is that the 
prima facie liability will sit with the social media platform, uh, but what it then says is um, uh, there's uh, a set of mechanisms um, to deal with uh, if you have a complaint scheme, if you disclose uh, user identity information when it's sought to commence proceedings, then um, you can avoid that liability. Now, it really comes down to the question of who is, who is best placed to manage these issues? And the platforms clearly have a technological capability that individual users do not. Um, it's their business model. They're best placed to uh, identify how to manage these risks. Um, and so that's really the judgment that we've made. I mean, I make the point, it's perfectly possible for the platforms in their terms of use to say to um, people who have a page, well, you know, these will be your responsibilities. Um, so th there's, again, what we're trying to do is regulate just enough. The Act or the Bill sets out clearly uh, what we want to achieve, um, but uh, much of the operational detail is going to be a question for the platforms and there may be many different ways of achieving it. So I think um, my scepticism about um, the efficacy of anonymity aside, I would like to acknowledge the fact that um, in order to um, unmask people, it will require a court order. Mm. And I think that is an important safeguard that is reflected in this legislation. So I think it's um, uh, um, being uh, fair on uh, in all of my commentary. The last question I have about this one is, um, it's interesting, and, and you mentioned this in your book, about um, states having responsibility for um, defamation. Yep. Um, in Australia and so just to confirm that you're framing this as um, a, a bill or legislation if it is to pass that will um, uh, that is focused around social media platforms rather than defamation because it is an interesting constitutional uh, needle you're weaving there. Look the substantive law of defamation is not changed by this um, uh, you know there's a whole series of um, judgments that the courts make on the facts of a particular case as to whether it is defamatory, you know, truth, public interest, all these considerations come into it. Um, we're not changing any of that. The majority of defamation cases are heard in state and territory courts. Um, we don't expect that to change. What this does do, uh, it would establish uh, a set of processes or mechanisms to uh, commence a defamation action um, and it also uh, gives very strong incentives for the platforms to set up a complaints mechanism uh, which if it works as we hope it will will mean that um, cases that otherwise might go to court could be resolved more quickly and efficiently. Mm. Okay, um, let's move on and, and talk a little bit about the e-safety uh, uh, legislation that passed, and in particular around um, the adult cyberbullying yes. provision, which is the, the, the fundamentally new aspect of that legislation. And I, I, my question is how, and, and you have touched on this a little, how that legislation will interact with the legislation around um, uh, uh, unmasking trolls, which I think is actually a bit of a misnomer because not all trolls behaviour is defamatory for example but um, the question I have is how often do you think um, the this new law would be used if it were to be passed in comparison to the cyberbullying and when you put them side by side um, the cyberbullying does seem to it has a lower burden so it's you're not requiring um, defamation which is um, uh, so the the barrier to entry if you like is less um, the you go to through the e-safety commissioner rather than through a court and um, it's a 24-hour um, period which is something that is new in that legislation as opposed to a long drawn-out court process it's free yep. as opposed to defam uh, as opposed to defamation yep. which is costly so do you think that this legislation putting aside its the effectiveness around anonymity do you think it will actually be used when we have such a strong new legislation in cyberbullying and I, I recognize the irony of sort of critiquing one proposal by saying how strong something else that you have uh, uh, introduced is there are certainly going to be online comments or posts 
which could potentially attract both pieces of legislation. But the principal difference between them, in my view, is that the bar to be able to access the cyberbullying provisions is quite high. It needs to be material that a reasonable person would consider menacing, harassing or offensive mm -hmm. and intended to cause harm. So it, it's very much about a comment um, directed at an individual with a, that would be concluded to have a particular intent. Um, there will be material which is a comment about somebody which potentially is defamatory but which does not meet the test of intended to cause harm. I mean, think about an online restaurant review. Um, and as we know over the years, restaurant reviews have, have from time to time uh, caused actions in defamation. So, um, you know, if somebody posts, uh, you know, I went to that cafe Paul Fletcher is running, it's hopeless, the bloke obviously can't cook to save his life. Um, that would not be, you know, menacing, harassing or offensive intended to cause harm. Uh, but there would be a question as to whether if I was, um, you know, as the subject of a comment, whether I felt that had done sufficient damage to my reputation, I wanted to uh, uh, take action in defamation. So there, there's potentially some overlap, but um, I think the, the adult um, cyberbullying provisions, um, as I say, there's quite a high threshold and it, it really is about um, uh, intended to cause harm and th th that a reasonable person would conclude it was intended to cause harm. So when you describe those thresholds, I mean, I, I think um, defamation is a cause of action that is, is of course available, but is, there's a high cost bar yes. of getting involved in that. Um, the, the threshold, as you describe it, of the cyberbullying is quite high. Yes. Do you think there's more to be done just in terms of social norms that it will perhaps have more effect than regulation and legislation in addressing the type of behaviour that you're talking about? Look, I think it needs to be tackled on several fronts. One of the reasons that we're talking about anonymity is because there is a perception that what you do online is anonymous and so you can say and do things that you would never say to somebody face to face. Now, I accept the proposition that there are certainly trolls who are quite happy to have their identity known and um, it seems to be part of their motivation. But um, there is, I think, good evidence that we also see people uh, engaging in pretty abusive commentary online because they think uh, they're protected by a cloak of anonymity. So one of the things we want to do uh, is improve the norms of behaviour and as well as the uh, anti-trolling legislation in the Online Safety Act, the Safety Commissioner has been given powers to require the platforms to um, provide the identity information they have about a user account. So, um, and that might well be used for example if there was somebody who was engaging in um, systematic abuse and the objective was to identify that person and perhaps um, uh, pursue that, um, pursue penalties which the Safety Commissioner has the power to issue as a means of um, helping communicate to the broader community. Well look, don't assume you're anonymous online because um, um, that's not, that's very often not the case. And are you concerned of the, the privacy implications or the security of the information that is going to be collected either for this, this legislation or for the online safety legislation? Uh, look, there's absolutely a balance when it comes to issues of privacy and security. And clearly there are circumstances where um, uh, it would not be desirable that somebody's identity be revealed. That's why, as you rightly point out, under the draft legislation, it would require a court order and there'll be a need to balance up these considerations, or through the voluntary complaint scheme, it would require the consent of the person who posted the material. Um, similarly, when it comes to the Safety Commissioner's powers, again, as a regulator, she'll be in a position, um, Julian Mangrada, a Safety Commissioner, her, her staff will be in a position to weigh up those issues. So yes, these things absolutely do need to be weighed up.
And I thought it was interesting um, looking at the legislation yesterday that the information that you're requiring, um, and this is the um, anonymous uh, troll legislation, is um, name, phone numbers and email address, which is largely information that many people would give um, to a platform provider anyway. And it, the in the Korean case, actually, the, the legislation resulted in a massive data breach and that was part of um, the, the concern around that legislation and I, I personally was was comforted a little to see that the, the requested information was relatively narrow but I do note that there's provision there for that to be expanded via legislative rules which does raise um, a few concerns that it may be expanded over time. And I suppose the point I'd make is that again as we consult on the detail um, uh, we can work through all of these issues including for example um, part of part of the question is okay what information do you need to commence legal action mm. and that's the thing that the courts can rule on or that mm. we can determine through legislation that the courts then apply mm. and if the comment if the uh, comment or post that you're seeking to make the subject of defamation action has been made online by a user, then uh, the holder of a user account, then um, the capacity to uh, commence legal process, to serve uh, the commencing documents, if you can use those online tools, then arguably you don't need uh, some of the other things like physical address and so on that historically the courts have used. Mm. So those are all issues to be worked with. Yeah, and I, I think they're very important issues. Mm. Um, likewise, I think um, it, with respect to the, the evidence about um, how much of the trolling behaviour is actually anonymous, there's quite a lot of research that that behaviour, a lot of anonymous, that most of the malicious trolling behaviour is actually people under their real name. So I'll be very interested to see how that um, mm -hmm. progresses. Let's move Move on um, to um, another element of um, the e-safety legislation um, and particularly the, the um, uh, provisions around the basic online yes. safety um, expectations. This is happening as a, as a subset along with the development of industry codes. One of the things that perhaps has been most topical about that legislation um, or that um, uh, direction, sorry, that's sitting underneath is the reference there to encryption and I know this is something that that um, has been um, a strong criticism of, of the Morrison government is your approach to encryption. You mentioned it briefly yes. uh, in the book. Um, and I think if we were to sum up the main criticism of it, it's that um, the approach to, to encryption seems to be the bad guys use encryption. Um, we need it to um, prevent um, access to child pornography or terrorist behaviours. Um, therefore, um, we need this legislation. And there are many who would say that actually, um, you know, encryption also has a very important purpose in our societies, including, for example, to um, underpin our financial systems. The banks wouldn't work without encryption. Yep. Um, so how do you respond to that criticism? And are you also in the same token concerned that some countries outside of Australia um, would be watching what we're doing around encryption or anonymity? Um, and those countries might not have the same human rights protections or um, respect for rule of law and how you balance that uh, in the global environment, which is something you also yeah. touch on. Um, so the, the idea behind the basic online safety expectations is that the parliament through the Minister for Communications on behalf of the Australian people is saying to the platforms, these are the things that we expect you will do and we ask you to report against them and there are penalties for failing to report. And it's things like having uh, an easy to use complaints system um, and I guess a range of other things that we would say based upon the collective, the experience particularly of the eSafety Commissioner in dealing with platforms, um, as new platforms emerge, you know, TikTok came along only three or four years ago for example now very, very popular, uh, there'll be others. Mm. Um, these are the things we expect you to do. Mm. Um, uh, and it's intended to be quite a practical, mm. workable yep. document. 
Um, and, and I would say, I, I actually commend you on that document. I think it is um, a, a very useful document to set the expectations yeah. for the platforms. Yeah. But I guess my question is more specifically on um, the encryption point, because part of those documents were saying that you these expectations apply also to encrypted communications. Mm. And that's a, um, an interesting, uh, uh, if it's encrypted, how are, the, how are platforms to? Well, again, we're looking at it through a safety lens. So um if you're a teenager in a, an online chat group uh bit bit whatsapp or whatever the service is and there are abusive comments directed at you seen by 50 or 100 people in the group um i guess the basic point we're making is it's not good enough to say oh it's encrypted so you know that's 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 beyond the realm of, um, I guess, regulatory concern here. On the contrary, um, uh, it's, if it has the effect, if it's seen on the screen by the user, um, then the fact that it's encrypted, um, we're saying, look, you've, you've, you've got to have regard to the safety of your users um, and you know we've got a set of expectations here we've got a set of requirements um, and you can't just say oh well it's encrypted so forget all that yeah so so i am i am i understand what you're saying mm. particularly with respect to a lot of the the popular social media mm. platforms are, are either already end-to-end -end yes. encryption or becoming encrypted. So I, I understand the concern, I understand young children are using mm. these and there is bullying behaviour. Yes. But at the same time, something is either encrypted or it's not. Sure. And as um, a good friend of mine often said, it's maths. Yes. You, it's either encrypted or yes. it's not. Um, and so it does raise particular challenges because if you weaken encryption for something like this, you're also potentially weakening, in, or most likely weakening encryption for things like the banking system. Mm -hmm. um, and you know that is a, a difficult balance. And sure. I, I suspect you might. Well, I'll give you the opportunity to say something more. But um, uh, it is uh, a concern for many people when they're looking at the approach for Australia around these things. Well, certainly in terms of the basic online safety expectations, the way that we would think about this is these are things that if you're providing a service to millions of Australians and hundreds of millions of people around the world, but certainly our interest is in the safety of Australians, we certainly hope that our approach will be of interest in other countries and the evidence is that it is, um, uh, then um, again, I, I, I can't put it any more simply than the fact that it's encrypted is not a get out of jail free card. It, it doesn't allow you to say, well, we don't have to worry about safety. Quite the contrary. Okay, great. Um, so I would like to come back to the point about um, international um, exporting of yes. our policy. Um, but before we do that, um, given how much um, work and attention and, and by yourself, by the eSafety Commissioner, Julia Mann Grant, who does an excellent job, um, this, the announcement of the um, inquiry into um, big tech um, I, I, comes as a little bit of a surprise in terms of the amount of work that has been done. This new legislation uh, will come into play um, in January. Why is the inquiry needed now, um, given the changes that are about to come in? And why do you really think you can do this issue justice in three months over a Christmas period after the year that everybody has had? <laughs> I think there's several reasons why. Firstly, the eSafety Commissioner is about to have significantly expanded powers. There's a number of codes that are being made. We're finalising the basic online safety expectations. So it is an opportunity to, I guess, um, pressure test with the community. What are your present experiences of online services? Parents, schools, children um, and other stakeholders. Um, and those findings will undoubtedly inform the way that the Safety Commissioner exercises her powers. Uh, secondly, we've clearly seen in the revelations by the Facebook whistleblower Francis Horgan um, 
troubling indications of business practices, uh, the way that the algorithms uh, operate, um, and in particular the mental health implications of that. So are users encouraged to go more and more down a rabbit hole of a particular subject? Um, you know, an anorexic teenage girl um, seeing more and more content about dieting and, and, and body image and so on. Um, so uh, those are um, some very significant issues that we think um, need to be examined and we also think it's an opportunity for the tech companies to um, come forward and talk about what their safety practices are um, and explain to Australians how they're keeping them safe. So um, this is a very important set of issues. It's clear to me as a politician and to my uh, colleagues from the number of times this gets raised with us, it's of big concern to families and parents and, and to, and to um, to kids um, and so uh, I couldn't think of anything that is more appropriate for the parliament to be looking at than an issue, than an issue like this which so much goes to the safety of Australians. So I don't disagree with you, I think it's just a question of the timing yeah. and the length of the time um, and it seems to me that you're indicating that there might be further action that comes out of this beyond the new e-safety uh, legislation that comes into play in, in January. Sure, well I'm saying a couple of things. Firstly that under the powers the e-safety commissioner now has, um, she's got quite a degree of discretion, quite a number of regulatory tools. This inquiry will be very useful in informing for her how she might use those tools. But yes, of course, if we identify other areas where we think action is needed, um, uh, we certainly stand ready to do that. These uh, social media services are such a prevalent part of the lives of Australians. Um, uh, many hours a day, many millions of us uh, from quite young ages. So these are uh, very important issues. Um, we've certainly over the last few years done a lot of work in putting a regulatory framework around them but we certainly don't think that the job is done. Um, let's touch on the media bargaining mm. code because um, it's something that you talk about in, in the book quite extensively um, and also I think is, is one of the um, capstone pieces of policy. Um, everyone will remember it, we had the standoff with Google and Facebook, um, government um, held your ground um, and we now have a situation where Google and Facebook are paying uh, substantial amounts of money to a small number of media providers um, in Australia. Outside of the code though, so the code allows for um, the uh, negotiations to happen outside of the code. Now. On the one hand, that's a victory because that money was not being um, paid to news um, companies in Australia before the government took this action. Um, I'm focused on the efficacy point and if the uh, obligation or the uh, intent of that legislation was to um, shore up and ensure that we have good journalism in Australia, do we have, is there um, evidence that the money that is being given to media companies is being used uh, to support media? And then the subset of that conversation is, um, is this actually um, inadvertently entrenching large media companies in Australia because they're the ones that have been, um, in, the deals have been done with, you know, the, the large uh, media companies, not with um, the small or startup um, environment uh, companies. So um, it, it, I'm not disputing the money is now being paid and that was the objective, but it's more about the objective of improving um, and shoring up Australian journalism. Yeah, the underlying public policy objective was, first of all, the competition policy issue that you have news media businesses competing with Google and Facebook for advertising revenue, yet Google and Facebook were using content paid for and generated by news media businesses and not acquiring in ordinary commercial terms. Mm. So first of all, there was the competition policy issue. But secondly, there was the media policy issue. In a liberal democracy, you want a diverse, vigorous media, and that was significantly under threat from the dominance of the platforms. 
We've now had, I think, about uh, around 15 deals that Google has done, slightly fewer for Facebook. Uh, significant dollar amounts, a couple of them have been publicly disclosed by listed mm. companies. Uh, and um, there is good evidence that they're using the money to hire more journalists. Mm. Uh, News Corp has been advertising for journalists uh, and uh, in some cases specifically linking it to News Media Bargaining Code. Um, I noticed in the Australian Financial Review just the other day um, an ad for, for journalists and mm. saying for the first time they were increasing their newsroom for some years. So I think there is pretty clear evidence mm. that this money is being used to hire more journalists. On the question of the size of companies, I guess the way we looked at it was the journalists around Australia, what's going to be the most effective way to maintain and increase their number? Mm. And clearly the most effective way is to um, go to the biggest uh, employers of journalists. Um, that being said, uh, there is quite a, a wide range of businesses that have received uh, funding and the uh, revenue, the, the minimum amount of annual revenue you need to earn to qualify to seek to negotiate under the code is 150,000. So mm. um, it, it can certainly cover quite small businesses. Mm. Um, I mentioned before, our principle was to regulate just enough mm. to get the outcome that we wanted. And so we think it is a very positive thing that these outcomes have been done through voluntary commercial negotiation but clearly the reason the platforms have come to the table to negotiate is because they know that if they don't, they will find themselves in the compulsory bargaining process. Mm. I think um, we'll all be watching closely to see who else um, uh, has these agreements entered into. Um, final question for you, because I'm conscious we're coming up to time. One of the most common criticisms of government regulation in this space is that for better or for worse, and um, this is not intended necessarily as a criticism of politicians or of public servants, but they often don't understand the technologies that they're regulating um, or they don't understand them as well as industry does. And I think that was evident, for example, with the media bargaining code, where one of the main criticisms of it was that there was a misunderstanding, for example, of the nature of the internet and links. Um, so two part question. One, um, would you do it? Would you uh, craft that legislation differently knowing what you know now. You've been in um, conversations with heads of Google and Facebook, for example, around the technical part, not the intent, but the, the technical drafting of it. And how do we um, upskill to address this asymmetry of knowledge where actually there is a real legitimate public purpose for government to be legislating and taking action in this space? And I encourage and commend that. Um, but how do we make sure that that regulation and, and regulatory interventions achieve their purpose with um, respect to the, the actual technical applications when that knowledge is largely held by the, the industry partners? On the first question of the specific legislation, would we do it differently? I would say no. Um, we did consult pretty extensively. We went through, I think, three successive drafts in which there was consultation. Uh, and we did that in a very conscious way. And bear in mind, it started with a process of the ACCC developing the Digital Platforms Inquiry. The final report was several hundred pages, so that was about an 18 month process. Um, we then uh, started on some development of the code, uh, extensive, uh, as I say, extensive consultation, successive drafts and so on. Um, but I'd also make the point that it does suit the tech companies to say, oh, government, you don't understand. If you seek to regulate us, your country will be a technological backwater. And I, I guess I've heard that most of the time I've been in parliament. Um, and it's a convenient thing to say if you want to avoid being regulated. Uh, but but I, I think there's a little, so I, I agree, I think the assessment of technological backwater is um, a, a move that the tech companies often use, but my experience, and I worked in the public service for the last 10 years on these issues, and I think the level of knowledge is very asymmetrical in favour of industry. So I do think there is some element of, of um, it is a fair comment in terms of um, expertise. So the, the second point I would make is that um, to some extent the solution to that problem lies in the hands of the tech sector mm. 
and indeed I welcome the fact that just in the last few months the sector in Australia has come together to establish the Tech Council which now has a hundred members including some of the biggest Australian tech companies Atlassian, Canva uh, amongst others um, uh, at the very highest levels. Um, uh, and indeed they had an event in Canberra just a couple of days ago. Um, uh, you know, Scott Farquhar and Mike Cannon-Brooks from Atlassian were there, Cliff Obrecht from uh, Canva. Um, so to have owners of these very large Australian tech businesses in Canberra walking the halls of parliament um, and engaging at all levels is a very good thing. So yes, uh, the business, the, the tech sector is complex. The um, technology is uh, fast moving. Um, and so I think it's a very good thing that that is happening. Um, and, you know, government uh, always seeks to, um, I guess, understand the industries that it, um, it regulates. It's not, a, it's not a perfect process. I'll readily concede that. Um, but um, I think I think there is improving mutual understanding. I would say. <laughs> I think that is very fair. And um, in closing, I have I have uh, focused on a lot of the um, challenging parts of the work of the government in this conversation. But I would like to end by acknowledging that one of the the things that is particularly heartening for me in this field is that there are more governments around the world waking up and stepping up to the fact that um, we can change and shape technology for the public good. And that is something that I am particularly passionate about. Um, so please accept my uh, critiques of you in the spirit that they're intended Look, in I, terms of... It's, it's a very important point. In, in the book, I seek to emphasise my strong belief that the internet is a force for Absolutely. economic, cultural, social, yeah. educational good, and that the world is a much better place thanks to this marvellous innovation. Um, uh, that doesn't mean it should be beyond regulation, but we shouldn't regulate it more than we need to. And government should also be very focused on how do we use the internet to deliver better services for citizens uh, where it can deliver huge benefits. So the internet, absolutely a big positive. Governments need to engage with it, uh, but I'd much rather live in a world uh, where so many of us are online than not. Absolutely, me too. And I'd much rather live in a world with regulation that is effective, and that's our mission at the Tech Policy Design Centre. So thank you very much, Minister Thanks, Fletcher, for Good. giving us your time. Pleasure to speak with you. Thank you.